Hello to everyone. I'm very glad to open this uh, course to our uh, audience and your students. Uh, so uh, yeah, my, my, my lecture was an introduction to the crowdsourcing and I discovered uh, several things about them. Uh, so, but, but firstly about me. So uh, my name is actually pronounced like Artyom, uh, but it's more convenient to write it like, like an Artem. So ne never mind. Uh, I graduated from St. Petersburg State University. I have a master's degree in computer science. And uh, while I was a student, I joined uh, Yandex. Uh, and uh, initially, I uh, developed some services for search quality assessment, which is kind of related to the topic of this lecture. Uh, after that, I was uh, uh, head of internal infrastructure for data labeling. And uh, um, after some time, uh, we also started to uh, create some applied services based on crowdsourcing, not on the search quality assessment, by, but another one. And now I am a CTO of Toka, so I am responsible for the whole development of this crowdsourcing platform. And well, so that's it. Uh, a few words about the plan of this lecture. So it, it will be uh, in, in five parts. Uh, so firstly, we uh, uh, talk about why the data is important. Uh, later, we uh, so sa see some applications of crowdsourcing. Uh, in the middle of the lecture, we are going to have a short uh, discussion about some barriers and applicability of crowdsourcing. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we are going to look at some tools and methods uh, how to do crowd management effective task. And uh, I cover some uh, actual challenges in this part of science. So uh, after each uh, part of this uh, lecture, I, I allow you to ask any questions and not don't hesitate to write them into the chat in Zoom. So uh, I guess Anastasia and Natalia will help me uh, to uh, ask these questions and I'll try to answer them all. So the first part is, uh, it's all about the data. Uh, First of all, uh, this is a reality in which uh, many data scientists actually live in. They usually use Kaggle and some given data sets. So uh, there you compete within a given data set. Uh, but in the real world, in real production and industrial applications of machine learning, you actually compete within the whole pipeline of machine learning production. So those who know how manage the data labeling, which is the, one of the important parts of machine learning productions, these people win. And uh, the second idea that I'd like to keep you after this lecture is that in the same way, you wouldn't want to outsource uh, the core expertise in machine learning within a company. Uh, so in the, this the similar way, you wouldn't want to outsource uh, the expertise in data labeling. Because as the time passes, the questions of data labeling become, become more and more important and become one of the main features of the industrial production for machine learning. And that's why we believe, and our team believes, that outsourcing of data labeling to some vendors uh, or external parties can no longer exist because it is one of the core expertises which must be kept inside machine learning team of the company. Uh, indeed, uh, it actually would be very interesting if you shared in a chat some sphere of AI you're working in or you're interested in, uh, but I can say that in general, any sphere we take somehow contain uh, machine learned products and AI products. So for example, it's about search or I don't know, self-driving, voice assistance, even e-commerce. So everything uh, on the, in this slide or, or beside it uh, somehow related to machine learning. And uh, let's dive deeper into this topic. Uh, so there are the following three pillars that contribute a lot uh, to the quality of AI-based uh, products and services. So the first one is algorithms uh, and methods for AI models. Uh, the second part is uh, computational facilities, hardware. And the last but not the least part of the AI is uh, data and their production, in particular data labeling. So currently, uh, the algorithms and hardware have become commodities. You can look at this slide and uh, find some famous frameworks and uh, 
uh, cloud services which provide uh, hardware for machine learning and some algorithms you can use uh, like open source and uh, there is very big variety of public solutions in these two spheres and in cost contrast to them ai community paid less attention to the third pillar but we believe that in the nearest future maybe now uh, this gap will be filled and uh, data production will be the main focus of ai community moreover we observe the rising of this trend at this and a last NeurIPS conference for example so uh, as i told you first two are commodities and the next focus will be the data and data labeling in particular uh, okay so uh, let's look at the topic uh, more broadly and uh, despite the obvious advantages automation driven by machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, carries long-term pitfalls uh, for the lives of billions of people so one of them is well known and includes disappearance of many well-established uh, mass professions which leads to unemployment and less visible uh, but more important pitfall arise in the other hand carried by the automation the automation accelerates consumption of data web data produced by humans so those data suppliers are often managed by old-fashioned uh, approach and have to work full-time on routine and press signed work types uh, so uh, surprisingly uh, these trends were both pitfalls and uh, were, were, uh, this, the trends where both pitfalls arise may meet each other at the data production so uh, this unemployment tends to uh, these people to uh, work as uh, data laborers and uh, this how this scheme uh, became a loop of of data and people work there uh, so uh, any question for the moment i see some notifications in our chat no uh, yeah we have a question like a comment um you say that labeling should not be outsourced but crowdsourcing is the same thing. It's not a, an internal team. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm saying it not about uh, the data labeling entire, but the, uh, the uh, how to say, uh, the processes and the knowledge how to prepare the data. So you, you, you definitely can outsource the task, not uh, label by yourself. Uh, every data set you, you, you need to label, but how to organize the data process uh, correct and uh, how to uh, formulate these tasks how to manage these crowd workers how to write them guides and all other topics we consider later in this uh, lecture so this is a key part of knowledge uh, which every uh, machine learning team should keep inside so that's what i meant okay any other questions no okay so let's go further so uh how we can get data uh so uh majority of uh, AI solutions uh, and applications of ai actually require some data levied by the human and uh, the irony is that they actually they all require this data labeled in a very large scale and the more the industry grows, the more grows the need of the human data labeling. So there are two straightforward ways to improve the quality of an AI product. The first is to add more training data to your training set. And uh, thus, uh, so the more data you have, the better you train your formula and the better you work. And the second part is uh, faster validation and implementation of new models because if you're able to verify, test, and validate new models without having to wait for months for collecting a new portion of data, you can move much faster than your competitors. So to achieve both those parts, you need to know how to scale your data labeling production. And the major scene uh, here is the classical controversy between more traditional approaches to management and people management that have been traditionally used for data labeling as well so uh, and uh, what we call an expert approach when you have some uh, sorry and uh, when you have some 
uh, for example, data set and take some very high skilled person. Uh, it can be a student, it can be sometimes even a data engineer. It can be somebody else, somebody very highly trained uh, and uh, they would be doing some labels. Probably it would be fine and the quality of these labels would be okay. Uh, but the problem arises when you need to scale this production. And when you need to, when you need not one student or one engineer or at least 10 people to label your data or maybe 100 people of maybe or maybe thousands of people it becomes purely impossible to manage this in a classic way so instead of that uh, we use uh, what we call a crowdsourcing approach uh, when we build businesses business processes which actually do not depend on the skill of individual performer but rather the result depends on the quality of the design of the process in general. So when we decompose the huge and difficult task into a set of small and very simple tasks, we apply quality control techniques on every side and we apply some authorization techniques on every step. And thus we get the pipeline, which is actually more effective, easier to scale and easier to manage and measure. And it can be measured because it has quality control steps in every part, so etc. And this is what we call a crowdsourcing approach, as I said, and a specific way to design a business process when you have some huge task and you decompose into small parts and send it to cloud of independent performers, uh, where every single person in this cloud of performers actually makes a very small effort, but their efforts taken together are then aggregated on the side of the requester and come up with the final result of the initial huge in this task. So that's the great thing when we take a huge task, decompose it to smaller ones, and after uh, performers made their answers, we combine the result into the solution of the initial huge problem. So that's that's uh, what uh, motivates me more uh, doing such, uh, such things at my work, for example. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's uh, talk about some management styles. Uh, so I think uh, this is a really big uh, problem in modern AI industry and the modern industry of data labeling. So it is the quality of the conditions of the work of those people who do labeling in a traditional approach. Because you can find many cases uh, when people sit in some gloomy offices and do this manual work like routine data labeling hours after hours. And they have no opportunity to have breaks without real perspectives of their career goals, etc. So unfortunately, it has become even worse during the pandemic. So you have probably heard of some cases when even uh, large technological companies managed to send all their engineers to work from home in order to protect them from the pandemic. <laughs> but those poor data laborers in many cases were not able to move their productions to work from home. Uh, and they still had to risk their health and stay in such quite uh, dangerous conditions in a modern situation. So I guess it's quite awful. Uh, but uh, we believe that uh, this that this uh, can and actually should be different and should be changed and it can be changed. Uh, in general, this approach towards the data labeling industry. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, it should be changed, as I said, and uh, we believe that uh, data labeling as a routine job shouldn't be something you force. Uh, a person to do hours by hours regularly, etc. So we believe that this is a totally flexible story when anyone can join at any time and it's his, they are free to choose any task they want, uh, free to stop and have a break or switch to another task. And actually does, doesn't matter for really well-established crowdsourcing process. So it uh, doesn't matter whether a person is doing your task uh, uh, day after day on a regular basis or they just come now and then so they can come today and spend for instance uh, 10 minutes or two hours and they come back tomorrow in a month or in a year it doesn't matter as I said. 
So uh, it actually does, doesn't depend because uh, if we smartly use all the mathematics and the methodology of crowdsourcing, we can effectively use even the smallest and irregular signal from the smallest effort of every single person to transform it into a useful signal for your training data. So that's the key thing here in the crowdsourcing approach. Okay. Uh, when we have lots of people who do not have any strict obligations, we require just uh, minimal efforts from uh, different people. And then we deal with a crowd as, a, as with yet another computing cluster and use the API to, and some mathematical methods and tools. We set up automated pipelines for data labeling, which finally results in effective processes of data labeling. So imagine that this crowd uh, is like a, a computing cluster of human brains, something like that. Uh, so uh, the next part uh, will be from, for we, we will be, we will contain some examples. So uh, I'm curious uh, whether the main message of how the crowdsourcing approach is different to the classical approach. Uh, so whether my message uh, is clear, uh, any questions? Maybe someone wants to, to discuss or say, no, it, it won't work. <laughs> okay, you will have, have a chance during the, okay, um, anybody? I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, putting crowdsourcing as a, putting a crowdsourcing management as, a, as an API task is a, is, a, is a funny way to look at it, but it's uh, super correct. It's yeah. a super smart approach. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. I have at least one one who uh, believe in that, like me. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's uh, consider some examples. Uh, I don't know, but I guess there are, there are someone uh, who uh, do computer vision and uh, who is a computer vision industry here. So I. Uh, repeated that it would be great if you shared uh, with us uh, in, in the chat. Uh, so, uh, but I, I think most of you know that uh, this is a classical task, for example, for self-driving uh, cars production. So in order to train your computer vision models, uh, you need to feed it with thousand or even millions of images in which every object is highlighted with a polygon. So every car, every pedestrian, every traffic light sign, everything. It's uh, quite an, an trivial task of how to actually produce those millions of images day by day on daily basis, because self-driving cars require more and more data specific to regions. So they need to more and more data to train their models. So the weather changed, the, some uh, conditions changed. So you need a huge data set of these labeled images to make uh, self-driving car see the road and everything around it. Uh, so how can it be done? Uh, so for the final result, we need to have an image uh, where all objects are highlighted with polygons. And what we do, uh, we decompose the task into a set of subtasks. Each subtask is devoted to a specific category. For example, it can be please highlight uh, all the cars or please highlight all the pedestrians or please highlight all the traffic signs, uh, etc. And uh, so the task is decomposed into a set of those smaller ones. And then we ask a person to make quite a minim, minor effort, for example, to highlight all the traffic signs in the picture. Then we have a second step of this process when this image with all the traffic signs highlighted by the first person. So this image is shown to several other people and they ask to say, okay, uh, please verify uh, that all these uh, traffic signs are highlighted correctly. And if they vote that everything has, has been done correctly, it's fine. If they see some mistake there, there is a third stage uh, where you uh, where yet another person is asked to actually find and correct the mistake and thus having a loop until there are no mistakes and they can actually collect a set of images in very effective and efficient way. 
So this uh, pipeline really works. Uh, so let's consider another example. Uh, so uh, at Yandex, we have uh, our own voice assistant. Uh, uh, its name is Alisa. So uh, uh, in order to activate a voice assistant, you need to collect a lot of recordings of the voices of different people uh, of different ages uh, and uh, some other uh, uh, properties. And they, they need to say, hey, Lisa, and these uh, recordings uh, are used to train the model to recognize it correctly. Uh, but the final result is very simple. You need to collect the audio recordings of the phrase, hey, Lisa, phrase, hey, Lisa, and uh, the task is <laughs> to ask person to say this, this phrase. Uh, at, the, at the second stage, we ask several people to listen th to this phrase and verify if it has been done correctly and there are no any irrelevant phrases or noises or anything else. So if everything is done correctly, then the, the phrase is accepted and the task is accepted. And if not, uh, it is sent to another person. So it's a very simple task and every participant of this pipeline has to really make the smallest effort possible in just to say a small phrase or just to listen a small phrase. So, but then when you multiply to dozens or thousands of people, you can in parallel collect many such voice recordings. So this is, for example, a real life case of 400 uh, phrases uh, with such approach uh, have been collected within only 10 minutes for several uh, dollars in total. So I, I, I guess it's amazing. Uh, another case uh, related to speech technologies as well uh, is audio transcription. So it's uh, like a vice versa task when you have already some phrase in a voice and you need to transcribe it into text. So it's a more different, uh, difficult task. Uh, that's why the first stage you would need to somehow train and select performers in the crowd who understand the logic of your task. Because there are many nuances, for example, how to transcribe some side noises in the audio, or how to transcribe international words or something like that. So there are some specifics which you need to explain to other people. Uh, but after that, uh, the task is also quite simple. Please listen to a short audio and transcribe it into the text. And we ask several people at the same time to provide these transcriptions. And we repeat it until we get, for example, K exact matches of the text phrase that we have been transcribing. Uh, and when we collect uh, K exact matches, we stop and we continue adding more and more transcri transcribers until we get the final transcription. So this such kind of loop there. Uh, so this is also a very scalable approach because once again, every single participant makes the smallest effort and every person needs to listen to one audio and write it down in text. So it's pretty much easy. Uh, then you ask thousands of people at the same time to do the same thing and you can describe, for example, 3,000 short phrases within a couple of hours for several dollars in total for the whole production for this thing. So uh, <laughs> I repeat to say, I repeat saying that uh, that's amazing for me. Uh, so there can be actually more untrivial ways uh, to use crowdsourcing. Uh, for example, this is one of the cool examples which I uh, really like. So it's not uh, exactly related to machine learning, but it's quite interesting. Uh, let's speak again about Alisa, our voice assistant. So she is actually loved by the users of Yandex uh, for having a very strong personality. So she has a very bright character and she likes to tell some jokes. She is sometimes a little bit sarcastic. So people really like just to have a chat with her. And of course, the term, the team of Alisa had to build uh, up some scalable production for the jokes because there are dozens of millions of people who chat with Alisa every day and she needs to have a lot of jokes in her vocabulary, not to be repeating and not to be 
a boring friend uh, with whom to talk for the uh, to talk to for the users so uh, but then uh, there is a very interesting problem of how to formally estimate such subjective thing as a sense of humor so of course there is a professional team of copywriters who can write jokes for alisa uh, and they write and they write and they write uh, but we need to somehow relate whether those jokes are really good or not or somehow rank them from the best to the worst ones so here crowdsourcing was works pretty effectively because for such subjective tasks, it's a very effective way to use what we call side-by-side -side comparison. So it can be quite hard to formally measure to which extent you find uh, this joke funny or not. It's quite hard to answer for every person. But if you see two objects, for example, two jokes, it's quite easy for a person to choose which one they like better, uh, the left one or the right one. So when we have uh, lots of these jokes compared by lots of these people on a side by side, side by side way, uh, we can finally get a ranking and uh, an objective ranking of all the jokes. And then we can take the top of those jokes and send them, send them to the production to be used by the voice assistant. So, uh, and this is also, an example how crowdsourcing uh, can be used and you can have for example 150 jokes uh, each evaluated by 20 people within only 30 minutes and it's also for a couple of dollars to collect such data and use this approach for objectively estimating some subjective things <laughs> I, I I want to do this for free. <laughs> they, you show me jokes and I, I need to relate them. So I, I guess it's a perfect job. Okay, uh, so any questions uh, related to these yeah, examples? There were two questions. Um, the first one, how about labeling that require the main ex expertise? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh so the main thing is uh and uh, i i i try to explain you uh, one more time next uh, in this uh, lecture as well uh, but the main thing is decomp decomposition so if you uh, can decompose the complicated task into smaller parts or even build a pipeline when you uh, step by step select people or even train them to do uh, some hard things. It's quite, uh, I guess, solvable problem uh, for crowdsourcing. So, for example, uh, we have some we have some uh, task uh, uh, which are uh, running in our platform uh, where uh, users uh, need to uh, use some very uh, sophisticated tool for 3D uh, bounding boxes uh, marking. So they uh, they uh, look at this scene uh, made in 3D by uh, leaders of the self-driving car, and they need to use some 3D boxes to uh, put them around the objects on this scene. So this is quite uh, hard task, and uh, you need to learn this tool. Uh, to to use it, but uh, it's solved and uh, using some several steps of uh, training uh, training uh, tasks and uh, some uh, good written guides and some other techniques uh, how to build this pipeline. So it's uh, it's it's can be done uh, by crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second question is practically about the same. Is the reviewer task depend on one's expertise? Uh, sorry, maybe I, I, I don't get the question. Um, I send it into Telegram. OK. Uh, is the reviewer task depend on one's expertise? So uh, you mean, uh, is there anybody else who reviews the results of uh, performers on the platform uh, 
in, in general, no, but uh, there are some pipelines uh, when uh, you can do the same. Uh, so after the first step, when someone makes a task, you can call another one who would be a reviewer and uh, they look at these initially done tasks and uh, decide whether it's done correctly or not. So you can, uh, you, you can have, for example, uh, thousand people on the first step and only few or uh, 10 people on the second step uh, since you review not every task but uh, some uh, some uh, selection of them so I, I i don't know whether i answered the question but <laughs> this pipeline is also quite common in for some cases in crowdsourcing and maybe i can add for example, your expertise can be your language, like, you know, English or, you know, Russian or, you know, Japanese, and uh, your task will depend on your skills. And that's important. Ah, yeah, you, you, let's, yeah, I, I, I understand the other, other meaning of this question. So, uh, yeah, uh, for example, in Tolka, uh, we have uh, quite, uh, sophisticated system and use machine learning inside to match uh, to workers within the appropriate tasks. So we suggest them the task they, uh, they will be good at. So firstly, so uh, this code uh, like matching uh, from the side uh, of uh, performers to do the, the best task they, they can do on the other side. This, this can be achieved because we have a lot of data uh, how, how good uh, every particular uh, performer is uh, on some uh, task types and we suggest them uh, similar tasks uh, as, uh, as, uh, he, as they uh, did before. So maybe, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, now we have time uh, some time to discuss your thoughts and insights about crowdsourcing. Uh, so uh, uh, we will create uh, several breakout rooms and in these groups uh, you, we ask you to share your thoughts on some questions. So first of all, uh, take some time to meet, meet each other and then share your thoughts about the benefits of crowdsourcing. Can this approach uh, cover some Def, def, uh, deficits of in your current projects, for example, and then uh, discuss the limits and possible complications of crowdsourcing. What will the most likely become a problem? What is the barrier which stops you from using crowdsourcing? Uh, so this discussion will last uh, for eight minutes only. Uh, then we will get back uh, to our conference. And if you finish the discussion sooner, get back to me and we can have a chat as well. Uh, so please know that uh, this discussion is not about correct or incorrect answers. Uh, so I won't judge you for them. Uh, we just want you to reflect on what you know about crowdsourcing so far and its applicability to your products. So please uh, follow the link. Uh, I guess it's already sent to the chat and I await you here in eight minutes. Okay, so let's uh, have a look uh, what you discussed and uh, put on the stickers. So I, I guess we have uh, one winner here, uh, the room number one, uh, and uh, and room six uh, works pretty much good. Okay, uh, let's uh, look at the stickers. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, ability to acquire specific labels that are unavailable or difficult, impractically difficult to achieve elsewhere. Yes, yeah, so the crowdsourcing is, uh, since it has very large uh, amount of people inside the uh, crowdsourcing platform, so you are able to find anyone you need for your tasks. And uh, yeah, dramatically reduce the amount of time and accumulate nature. Yes, sure, for sure. Uh, the first, yeah, so this is the good uh, guess, but I guess good thought uh, that uh, 
if you show the same thing to different people and somehow aggregate their answers so you uh, get more information uh, from this uh, group of people uh, that's what uh, is called uh, wisdom of crowd so something like that uh, they may uh, yes by validation testing so sure so what what worries uh, are provided by the first team uh, information might be noisy yes it could be noisy not only by some subjective nature but because uh, uh, people make errors and uh, they even may skip some answers and so on so you need to control the quality accurately defined the labels and zero passing criteria is tricking and run free labels quality yes uh, we will talk a bit later about that uh, what should uh, we do when the input arrives from two distant domains mm, I, probably I, I don't get the this this worry maybe uh, the author want to uh, say it aloud sure okay. uh, I don't know if I can be heard yeah uh, you, I hear oh, cool yeah. uh, so I know I know it's pretty specific I, I wasn't expecting to all of my, ans my answers to be read out loud uh, to be honest but uh, uh, I'm dealing with currently with something that has to do with um, uh, code similarity for mm -hmm. all sorts of reasons and all sorts of uh, ways and uh, uh, we usually tend to stick to uh, pieces of code from the same language. So usually Python with Python or Java with mm -hmm. Java and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, but we are interested with finding similarities between different uh, languages as well. And so mm -hmm. I guess in in our case, I'm not sure what would happen if we present it to people. Like I can't expect in advance how their answers would behave. So um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's, I don't know, I guess it's, it's the same as defining an accurate uh, labeling criteria. I guess it's very close to that. Maybe, but I, I'm not sure, and uh, it's uh, hard to give you a solution in a few minutes, but I guess uh, when you establish uh, some process of uh, filtering out uh, the performers uh, who are yes. okay uh, with different languages, uh, so you, you can uh, build such pipeline which splits your data into different languages, and then you have some uh, these people for each uh, language and uh, they do the same job but they they know different languages for example so yeah something mm -hmm. like that okay so cool uh, great work thank you uh, let's uh, go uh, below and uh, look at some other teams stickers so room number six uh, reducing the amount of time yes so sure the crowdsourcing is much more uh, high speed solution than other ones it's cheaper as well and uh, uh, uh I can't. okay thank you guest <laughs> who moved this uh, sticker so for a single person to do the label it might be boring by crowdsourcing can be broken to short various tasks yes that's for sure uh you each person who involved in crowdsourcing may stop at any money moment but the uh entire data collection uh, doesn't depend on this particular person so the whole data set will be collected in time and uh, it's okay uh, difficult uh, difficult when the labeling requires expertise yes sure it's difficult but it's not uh, blocker but it's difficult i agree and sensitive data gets out of sight yeah so this is uh, for sure a good worry uh, I, I can give you some examples uh, uh, when uh, even sensitive data could be uh, sent to crowdsourcing solutions and to some public crowd workers. Uh, for example, when, uh, uh, when you want to label some documents and you're aware of uh, some personal data inside it, uh, so uh, uh, you, you can split it into several segments uh, so in that way that every sec every single segment won't contain the entire information about the person so the data won't be personal when you split the whole document into small segments and you can for example uh, transcribe uh, them uh, so recognize the text on them and 
do this uh, stuff you need after that for crowdsourcing purposes. So that's uh, could be solution, but uh, yeah, sensitive data in some cases is out of scope. So uh, is there anybody who wants to speak uh, about benefits and worries allowed? Uh, it's a good time to to know each other and to, to talk. So maybe someone. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe if you want to ask something a bit more specific, then uh, we can bring up more topics and examples. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's say for you, for example, at Yango, Yandex, do you, um, do you, are you able to segmentize the crowd that you're working with by language, location, source, uh, knowledge, previous tasks, previous stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. Almost uh, every option you, you said is available in the platform and I will uh, have a brief overview a bit later. So we have such filters by languages, region, locations, some, some other knowledge. And even the platform uh, doesn't allow you to filter by the option you want. You can uh, run some kind of questionnaire and ask people uh, about uh, some, some stuff you, you want from them and uh, assign them some uh, label, some skills, uh, some, uh, how to say, uh, so you can somehow mark your, your performers uh, to filter them and uh, allow only certain persons uh, to do your production task when you need some. Yeah, you mean do like an entry test, something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Good. this this also the common thing for crowdsourcing to have some initial testing, some questionnaires before uh, running a task to find your target audience and run a task to them, uh, not the whole crowd at all. Okay. So, uh, okay. Anybody else? Going to say a couple of words about how uh, the crowdsourcing actually works and we are going to consider our Toka and open crowdsourcing platform as an example of such platform and uh, crowdsourcing approach. So in general uh, Toka is an open crowdsourcing platform uh, it's an application and a website where everyone can register as a performer. Uh, we can we call such performers talkers, and uh, the requester or client, uh, ones who upload uh, tasks to the platform. So there are some companies, individual researchers or machine learning engineers who need some data labeling to be performed. Uh, the usage of crowdsourcing has certain advantages. Uh, some of them were, were noticed uh, by you uh, during the discussion. So first of all, uh, this is a production that runs uh, 24 hours, uh, seven days a week uh, without breaks. Uh, because if you have so many people ready to perform your task, uh, it means at, that at every single moment of time, there is somebody who would be performing your tasks and this is a unstoppable process. Uh, another way, uh, another very important uh, thing uh, is uh, that using crowdsourcing uh, doesn't uh, limit you with some existing small team of very finely selected and trained uh, laborers. So instead you get ex an access uh, to the collective wisdom of millions of people and you can find some very bright and interesting insights uh, from them. So which, which you could have never met if you have been using some limited number of performers uh, because every person in the whole universe is, uh, because every person in the whole universe, sorry. And uh, they are different, uh, they're from different regions. Uh, they speak uh, different languages. Uh, 
they have different hobbies, uh, they use different devices, and all that can be very useful uh, when we are speaking about collecting training data for AI. Uh, the last very important uh, thing uh, is actually on-demand scaling and the ability to scale and shrink. So it means that when you need to scale your production, it's not a problem because you there are so many people. They just increase the number of tasks and more people participate in your tasks. And uh, then if you need to turn your project off and, or reduce the amount of data, it's also not a problem because uh, people will just switch to task of other requesters and it will it, will, it won't be a problem from them, from, for them either. So, uh, and uh, uh, a couple of words about ourselves. So me, myself and our team who is now providing this course uh, started uh, several years ago as an infrastructure team for Yandex Search. Uh, we worked in search and uh, uh, my personal goal uh, was to provide uh, uh, infrastructure for data labeling and uh, uh, to other team uh, who, are, who were responsible for training their formula and validation of their new rank in formula and search. So uh, then we have grown up to become the infrastructure for the whole Yandex AI products, uh, which are a lot. Uh, it's not only search, uh, it's also, for example, cell driving cars, voice assistance, uh, ride sharing company, uh, e-commerce and uh, many different applications. And you can take any product of Yandex, uh, scratch it a bit, and you will find that uh, they have Toka inside for some of the purposes. So now our ambition is to become a worldwide infrastructure for the whole AI industry, because we see that the need for scalable and effective data labeling is still very relevant. And many companies still do not have such an effective infrastructure. And we believe that uh, we can offer it to many companies. That's why we are happy to share our expertise with you so that you can later also think of using it maybe. Uh, if we speak about our platform, uh, we have started uh, six years ago and uh, since then we have been growing constantly, both in terms of demand and supply. On the left, uh, you can see the number of different projects uh, which are active on our platform. Uh, on the right, you see the number of people and active users on the platform who have actually participated in some tasks and earned some money on the platform. So last year, we finished uh, with more than uh, uh, 2 million people who participated not, not two, sorry, four million people who participated in our task. So uh, this year, uh, I guess we expect even more. And uh, for me, it's a really impressive growth. Uh, right now on our platform, there are more than uh, 100 countries represented by our crowd. We have more than uh, 9 million registered performers and our performers speak more than 40 different languages. So of course, all the major languages on Earth are already covered with a certain number of performers. And the platform is available on all the major platforms. So we have mobile applications for iOS and Android, and also we have a website, so version for desktop users. Uh, so, uh, how do we make uh, sure all these different people will bring us quality enough data? So uh, the main companies uh, of the crowdsourcing are the following. Uh, the first comp company is decomposition. Uh, and the next ones are instruction, task interface, uh, quality control, aggregation and uh, some methods uh, for optimizations and optimizations of pricing and uh, some, some other uh, smart methods uh, to uh, improve your data webinar processes. So now I'm going to uh, consider each of these uh, components uh, uh, and have a short uh, description how it works and uh, what, what is it. Uh, but maybe 
anybody have questions uh, for the moment? No? Okay, so let's go. Uh, decomposition, what about uh, decomposition? Uh, in general, decompos decomposition is a way how you split your big task into several micro tasks of different types, uh, which you uh, then pass to a cloud of performers. And uh, why uh, do we usually apply it? Uh, decomposition is applied because uh, performers are usually non-specialists in your specific, specific task. So the statement is not about the education level of our performers, but rather about the specificity of your particular area of application or your particular area of AI techniques and so on. So this is why uh, very, this is why it's very important to quickly make performers familiar with your area. So it is very simple to understand that the simpler the task is, the more humans can perform your task. Thus, the turnaround time will be very small and the easier uh, its instruction is and thus the better the quality of uh, the better is the quality of task execution. So uh, you, the, your results uh, by design, you have higher quality if the task is simple. So I, I guess it's obvious. And of course, decomposition is a method to distinguish tasks with different difficulties. So it's a way to control and optimize pricing because in such a way you can control each step separately and tune quality or optimize the price set for performers. And of course, decomposition must be applied when you want to control quality by post verification. I'll tell you a bit later about that. Uh, we have the following simple rule uh, of thumb, uh, which we apply when we decide whether we need to decompose the task or not. Uh, the rule is uh, as follows. If uh, you have designed some task and you see that your simple requ requires an answer to select the amount more than three to five variants, or you see that your task has no long has long instruction and uh, that's it's hard to read. Uh, thus, you observe a strong criteria uh, that your task requires decomposition. Uh, let's consider several cases. Uh, so, assume that uh, you need to label some image, and you have. Uh, several questions for such labels. Uh, so uh, these are the questions. Uh, uh, who knows the correct answer for the first question? Uh, maybe speak it aloud. <laughs> okay, so uh, nobody knows or uh, to try to uh, to share their knowledge. Okay, so th the uh, correct answer is uh, the last one. So this is uh, not a cat, not a rabbit, uh, not a bear, uh, not a whale or, or cow. So the correct answer beyond this option is quokka. So quokka is some sort of small kangaroo. And maybe some of you have already seen this animal before. Uh, what is the main problem that we observe in this task? Uh, so in this task, we ask people to answer different questions and to switch the context uh, between each question. In, and some of the questions may, very, may be very hard to answer uh, because a human needs to upload a lot of information about how to assess this particular image with respect to particular questions. So for instance, when we try to ask a question about color, it's, uh, is it impossible that they need to decide whether it's brown, black, or other color, color? So it's important to upload the criteria to decide whether this animal is brown or the color is none of above. Uh, we suggest or we see that uh, this is about practice because uh, a good uh, practice is to apply decomposition here and send each question to a separate task task and in this way uh, there will be no switching of the context uh, and uh, thus uh, uh, this will improve uh, the speed of task performers and uh, of course this will reduce the number of errors that occur due to the switching of the context. 
Uh, now, the case of decompositions uh, is a false. So imagine that we need to highlight cause in the photo. So assume that uh, we have some instruction uh, to do that. Uh, and the main problem is that highlight highlighting can be done in different ways. Because for instance, if we highlight by bounding boxes, uh, several bounding boxes can be correct answers for this task. That's it's, it's very difficult to apply comparison uh, with control answers if you have some control answers for some share of such tasks. And it's uh, very difficult to apply some variants of aggregations of answers from different performers. And thus it's very difficult to compare a particular answer with an aggregated answer. So the solution is uh, follows. Uh, you need to create a separate task and another product where you ask another executor uh, the following question. Is the highlighting of all cows made correctly? Uh, since this task is a binary classification, this way you can control quality if this separate task by means of control tasks and maybe standard aggregation methods. So that's you uh, can control quality of the second project and you can control quality of the third projects uh, uh, in terms of uh, the answer done by the second uh, step uh, of, of this pipeline. Uh, just to show you that uh, it's not a theoretical thing, uh, but rather it's a real approach, uh, we have a real example. So we have the following rare example from decomposition of an offline data collection task. Uh, so just to show you that, uh, okay, uh, so imagine. Uh, yeah, let me show this slide. Okay, so imagine that we need to collect some photos uh, from points. So we need to collect photos, for example, uh, of many different restaurants. So we ask uh, performers to come to a particular point uh, in the city and take photo of, for example, entrance uh, to the restaurant. Uh, as a result, we are going to verify whether this uh, business, uh, for example, work uh, uh, at some particular hours. Okay, so uh, uh, so here is uh, how this pipeline looks like. Uh, I will show you really quickly, uh, but uh, uh, the you, you, you can see here that uh, we have different automated options uh, for it. And we have also several parts uh, that are performed by our crowd of talkers. So we use Toloka inside. And you can see that we have produced a lot of additional tasks designed to verify collected information. So this is real case. And this uh, quite complicated uh, pipeline works uh, every day uh, on the automated way uh, inside the annex. Okay, uh, so the next, uh, ah, okay, a, maybe any questions about decompositions because uh, decomposition is uh, very, uh, very strong idea uh, about crowdsourcing. So uh, I, 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 I need to ensure that everyone understands it correctly. Yeah, do you, do the, do you guys do the, do you consult your customers on how to decompose a task or do you let them figure out the best way to do it? I mean, your platform is kind of a managed services platform or no, do we you expect your customers to come up with their expertise. Yeah, expertise? no. Uh, so basically our platform is a self-service. So you come and uh, do everything you want, uh, but we have very careful uh, support team and you always uh, can ask them the question how to do something better uh, in, in our platform. So uh, we, we don't do the consulting in its uh, 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 initial meaning, but we help you to uh, go through the platform and use crowdsourcing in the best way. So if you have some real case, you, you can definitely write to our support and we will help you, of course. Or you can uh, listen to this uh, course and uh, have enough knowledge uh, to do it uh, by yourself, I guess. I'll start uh, with the second option and then I'll try the first one. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, uh, we have a question, question from the chat. Yeah. Uh, okay, are there templates for different decompositions? Uh, if you mean some templates in our platform, uh, the answer is no, uh, but uh, we are going to implement some of them. Uh, so for now, we have only templates for user interfaces. And I will uh, have, we'll, we will have a look uh, at them a bit later. Any other questions? Okay. So let's go further and uh, consider uh, the, the next uh, parts of uh, uh, some tools uh, about crowdsourcing. This is about instruction or guides for talkers. So a typical instruction is uh, given on this slide. So of course you need to describe the goal of the task. Uh, you need to describe the interface. You need to show, explain an algorithm to decide how to execute a task. And you need to provide examples. And of course, you need to consider several rare cases and examples. And uh, I, I won't pay attention to all these points, but the most important point is about rare cases. So most pitfalls are there. And let's uh, consider also several examples of such uh, bad things. Uh, so uh, imagine that we need to consider the following task. Uh, you need to answer this maybe simple question, is the cat white? Uh, so what is the correct answer, yes or no? Of course, no. It seems that the answer is very simple and the task seems clear. Okay, let's uh, consider the next example. Uh, who knows the correct answer? <laughs> uh, you can only choose between yes or no. Uh, and yes, maybe it's yes or not. Maybe uh, you want to find uh, only those images that have a purely white cat even without any black points on in the image. So in fact, we have an ambiguity here and uh, we can fix it, for instance, by the instruction. You need to clarify uh, what you mean under the a white cat. Uh, because maybe you have uh, your own intuition behind the white cat, but performers can use their own intuition behind the white cat, or thus you need to match your intuitions behind this term. Uh, okay, uh, that's the correct. Uh, what is the correct answer for, for this case? Uh, yes, it's possible that the designer of this task assumed that we need to uh, answer to all the cats are white, but maybe it's an incorrect image and the question is not uh, about, only, about only one cat. So this is a also a rare case. Uh, we see many cats in the image and uh, even we can <laughs> see not cats in the image, uh, but uh, for, for instance, kangaroo. So it's also a rare case and uh, uh, <laughs> the, there should be some guides uh, in your instruction how to treat this sample as well. Uh, and for example, this one, what is the correct answer here? So of course we cannot answer here as well as correctly because we have no image at all. The image uh, cannot be uh, shown in the browser, but maybe someone who initially uh, created this data set uh, follows the link and uh, the, that link uh, uh, worked uh, at that time moment. So uh, maybe this data may be some kind of uh, noise uh, if, if we answer randomly in this case. Uh, okay, and uh, there, are, there are a lot of rare cases and in fact, we cannot by design have some prediction of all possible cases that can occur for instance just uh, because uh, you need to explore all the images in the data set and you cannot do that on your own for an hour or something like that. So uh, in order to fix such situations, uh, the first point is that you need to write how to act when we have some non-standard situations in the instruction. So uh, another, another way is, uh, to fix this uh, problem uh, is to enable your users to report such cases. So maybe some additional button about some strange and some uh, wh when you can cannot answer at all. Uh, so let's go to uh, slightly to the task interface. Uh, so uh, 
let's consider it and uh, we suggest uh, also the best practices uh, how to create task interfaces uh, unfortunately i don't have a lot of time to discuss it but we of course have uh, have a list uh, and we can summarize them into two directions so the first direction is that you need to design your interface in such a way that performers of your task will be as fast as possible so they uh, earn money in exchange of their time so uh, the the fastest they can do your tasks the happiest uh, will be the performers and the second direction is uh, that you need to design your interface in such a way that users produce less errors and provide better quality for your answers so this is your incentive and now uh, we are moving to the most important part of uh, crowdsourcing components uh, it's uh, quality control so before i start i i am going to ask whether we have any questions uh, no? yeah we have a question Ed? about okay. um the interface and uh, can also be solved by aiding it's not a question it's a comment can also be solved by aiding not sure not clear answer no yeah, sure, it's, it can be solved, but uh, the problem will be in quality control. So why uh, and, uh, why, why won't performers answer at, at, at any time that they are not sure? So and you you will get the entire data set with answers that your performers are not sure in the answer. So uh, that's uh, why you need to control data, and, quality yeah, of data. To so. return to the previous slide, sorry for interrupting you. Okay, here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, there is no other questions. We can continue, I think. Ah, okay, so yeah, I, I guess these slides uh, will be available after the yeah. lecture. So if you uh, accidentally miss something, you, you, you can uh, look more carefully after the lecture. Okay, so the most important part of the crowdsourcing so the quality control uh, you can divide quality control techniques in three directions as well so the first one is about controlling the quality before task execution so uh, i told you before about selection of performers we uh, were uh, discussing some well-designed instructions so and so on so this is part uh, which can be done before task uh, is, is running and uh, the second uh, uh, part is uh, about uh, different ways to control the quality within and the same time with the execution of tasks so there are some techniques here so firstly uh, we, we consider them then wait sorry okay and uh, the last part is uh, you may guess uh, after task performance so some uh, uh, things you can do after the task is done uh, so how to for example verify it uh, afterwards or how to aggregate the result and uh, compute some consensus between performers so uh, let's move to the particular cases uh, uh, so, as I said, uh, firstly, you can control quality by correctly selecting your performers. You can filter them by some static or computed properties. And of course, you can use such notion as uh, skills. So uh, you can assign some variable to each executor and update this variable by some forms of techniques. And uh, this, may, this way you can filter out performers to do uh, they, they uh, which are not uh, matching your own criteria so of course the important thing is uh, that you can train performers on your task and make some examinations for them and so on uh, so uh, someone asked me before about some properties available to filtering talkers uh, performers so here they are uh, uh, the next uh, and i I think the most common way to control quality during during the task execution is application of golden sets, uh, also known as 
honeypots or control tasks. So it's a bunch of uh, task, uh, tasks with, with already known correct answers. And they are also shown to performers. And in this way, you can uh, evaluate the quality just by comparing the answers with the correct ones. So uh, there are some practical things that we usually suggest. And of, of course, uh, you need to provide distribution of answers in golden sets equally to the distribution in the whole set of tasks. It should contain rare answers with several variants. So of course you need to refresh uh, your set of honeypots regularly to avoid bots or and cheating. Uh, in, in this case, when uh, uh, some someone uh, remember all tasks uh, which are done by them and uh, see, oh, I see this uh, before then, probably it's honeypot. And uh, <clears throat> uh, if uh, your branch of tasks and this of uh, maybe thousands or millions of tasks and it's, it's very difficult to create a large set of uh, control tasks uh, so that's we uh, suggest uh, crowdsourcing here as well so we can automatically create a golden set uh, uh, by means of collecting answers with high confidence so for instance you can collect labels from performers that show very high quality and thus you can collect the golden set. So you also uh, make this loop uh, good uh, performers provide honeypots to control quality of the, the rest of performers. So I guess it's, it's very interesting. So th this is our best practices. Uh, of course, the important thing is uh, to motivate your performers. And uh, the most important part here is the price depending on the quality. Uh, we will uh, talk about this a bit uh, later. Uh, so there are some other methods uh, how to motivate uh, performers, uh, some bonuses, some uh, non-material uh, achievements uh, or leaderboards or something like that. Uh, so there, there are some tricks uh, how to remote uh, remove uh, bots and teachers or maybe some people who don't uh, who want just clicking and not uh, thinking about your tasks so you can control uh, fast responses uh, so you can uh, check uh, for example if if you judging some links in tasks so you can control whether this link has been visited uh, or if you uh, uh, have some videos in your task so you can check whether a video has been played or music uh, uh, or, an, or an audio has been played and etc so and uh, finally we have a very important thing that i've already presented several times it's a design approach when we ask performers from a different bunch uh, to verify tasks made by another group of performers so we call it post verification or post acceptance. Uh, and the most important thing here is that you must uh, use this approach if your task is sophisticated. Uh, so uh, for instance, when you cannot use control task or we, uh, you cannot use some consensus model, so you can uh, use this post verification. And uh, of course uh, you can uh, uh, perform it on your own so but but usually uh, we suggest using another crowd of performers uh, so yes so when you have some different projects and uh, the answer uh, correctness of answer depends on the other project uh, this this some here your project and you you already know about decomposition so you can apply apply it here as well uh, and uh, there is another one uh, from of the famous uh, ways to control quality. So it is a consensus uh, between performers. Uh, it means that you send the same task to different performers and then comparing the answers from them, uh, you can uh, derive some quality information about your particular task, answer or users. And uh, we also uh, will talk later uh, in the final part of our lecture, uh, but this is also the casing about uh, quality control. 
okay so maybe i was too quick uh, to consider the most important thing about quality control so any questions uh, uh, someone maybe who were, was afraid of uh, the quality of data uh, I, I guess you're, you're getting more confident in the results or not? Okay, so I, I guess no questions at this moment. So uh, let's uh, talk about aggregation and uh, uh, what is, what is this? Uh, so uh, I also presented uh, it uh, before. Uh, so when you have uh, different uh, answers from uh, different laborers, you can aggregate their single answers into a uh, more reliable result. And uh, there are some uh, interesting studies uh, when uh, some different algorithms of aggregation uh, improve the quality of the entire data set uh, with no change in answers of talkers. So there are some uh, probability models uh, based on uh, some characteristics of perf on performers and uh, of tasks uh, and they can aggregate uh, the data in more proper way and uh, increase the quality of the data set so I, if someone is interesting it's very very uh, interesting part of uh, the study of crowd science uh, okay so here we are uh, so uh, let's talk about uh, another uh, part about the, the last part, I guess, uh, incremental relabeling and pricing. So what this, uh, when I, when I, uh, when I uh, told you about some uh, aggregation and uh, some uh, consensus, I said that we show one uh, every single task to a bunch of performers and incremental, incremental relabeling means that we won't show uh, everything uh, to the whole uh, performers, to the whole amount performers. We will increase this amount uh, step by step. And uh, if, for example, one expert uh, with high quality comes to solve our uh, task, uh, then their uh, answer will be enough. And we won't increase the uh, overlap at all. And uh, uh, an expert, sorry for stopping you for a second. When you define yeah. an expert, you yeah. define a person that is working within your system for a while and has been validated before. Right? Yeah, so an, expert, these... an expert here means that uh, someone uh, uh, with high quality and we, uh, sure, we are sure about it. So uh, this uh, this is about some different uh, levels of skills uh, doing each particular task. So, high quality in this task or high quality within your platform? High quality in this task. So, uh, for, for this example, uh, incremental relevant means uh, it depends on uh, the quality in this uh, particular project. So, if, if, if you have someone with 99% uh, quality, then maybe the single answer of such person is enough uh, to get the result. And if if, if uh, someone come uh, comes uh, with uh, un unreliable quality or some low quality, then you ask uh, several people to answer and aggregate this result and get the same quality as the, as the next one. So that that's the thing. Okay. Uh, so uh, a few words about uh, pricing. Uh, so uh, pricing can uh, depend uh, on task design, uh, some uh, market economy aspects and uh, some motivational parts uh, for performers. And uh, uh, so uh, we, I guess, uh, later in this uh, course, uh, you will consider this uh, more deeply. Uh, uh, so uh, let me conclude this part. Uh, so the core thing that uh, uh, is uh, that uh, if you have conducted a uh, good decomposition of uh, your initial project or you on in your initial task, then you will get a simple instruction. 
you will get an easy to use task interface. You will be able to apply very simple quality control techniques and your performance will do tasks with better quality by design. So you will be able to apply standard aggregation models. And of course you will be able to easy, easily control and optimize pricing. So the decomposition is some kind of basement of all these techniques uh, which are applied after it. Uh, so we have uh, a few time to consider some actual challenges. Uh, so uh, I, I, I will uh, tell you about them uh, quite briefly and we will have uh, some time to discuss and uh, answer your final questions. So uh, basically uh, the research in uh, area of crowdsourcing uh, can be split in two directions. So first is uh, about mechanism and algorithms and uh, the other part is focused on performers. So uh, the main idea of the first uh, research is uh, boosting the quality of data, uh, which can be obtained uh, from crowdsourcing platforms. So I already told you about some different aggregation models. Uh, so as crowdsourcing relies on redundancy, so uh, we can aggregate multiple answers and achieve the better quality. And uh, some uh, studies are about some uh, difficulty, how to uh, estimate uh, the difficulty of the task, uh, uh, maybe in terms of uh, need of decomposition and something like that. Uh, and <clears throat> the other uh, part of these uh, studies are about performers, about some social things. So uh, the main idea is uh, improving uh, workers' experience and make them happy. So, uh, how to motivate them, how engage engage them into the task, uh, which uh, incentives uh, uh, have workers and so on. And, uh, uh, and uh, the other uh, part is about uh, some uh, uh, well-being. Uh, so uh, for example, whether uh, the interfaces are comfortable uh, to work in or something like that. Uh, and there are some novel directions. Uh, so for example, uh, crowdsourcing is not only about machine learning and data labeling. So even UX and UI design testing, the side-by-side -side comparison of uh, the uh, interfaces or icons for applications and so on. Some behavioral research, so some questionnaires for the uh, huge amount of people. Some even creative task when we ask uh, people to, for example, write down some text about something or and so on. And some subjective tasks when uh, we definitely have no uh, right answer. So we need to extract these subjective uh, thoughts from the performers. And the other uh, point here is about uh, combining humans and AI into one system. <laughs> so uh, for example, when, when you have a model uh, which uh, provide you some answers and uh, uh, in some cases when you are not sure in these answers, you can uh, take uh, people and ask them uh, about the answer. So this uh, machine and both machine and human complex uh, works even better than the model uh, itself. So this is called uh, human in the loop and some AI applications here. So I'm, I was so glad to have this uh, lecture. I hope you enjoy it too. And uh, now I'm ready to answer any questions you have at the moment. Thank you all every, every much, very much. So. Any questions, maybe? I, I, I see that there are some questions in uh, our chat. So does uh, your system have tools built in to remove, bot remove bots? Yes, uh, since uh, quality of data is a crucial thing for, from, for crowdsourcing and for the platform, 
uh, we constantly develop a lot of algorithms uh, to prevent uh, some malicious usage of platform and uh, we have some system wide anti fraud system anti fraud anti fraud algorithms so but uh, this uh, uh, doesn't exclude uh, the the need to establish your own quality control because uh, it's more related to the uh, subject of your task uh, to the questions you ask to workers and so on uh, thank you yeah, thank you it was great lecture and with practical parts and uh, we wait all of the participants next week and we will send the presentation and uh, the record of the lecture. Yeah, thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having us here. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Ciao. Thank you.